may be seated. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. <laughs> Again, I'm sure Tim said something, but thank you for all those that helped with our hanging of our Christmas decoration, called the hanging of the greens, and participated in that. It was a, a, a fun time for those who showed up. One, we had the men's ministry prepare a great breakfast for us, and and then Brother Lenny shared a good word from the word for us, encouraged us. And then we started setting up all the decorations. And it's always fun to watch people working together, having a good time, listening to Christmas music and praise songs. I got to unpack the nativity scene. Uh, I didn't break anything, so I was surprised they let me do that. I did discover, though, in unpacking the nativity scene that uh, not to worry, we have a backup baby Jesus. I didn't know that, we, that our nativity scene came with two Jesuses. So uh, I don't know if that's if somebody's planning on stealing baby Jesus. Please don't steal baby Jesus. But if you do, we do have backup. He's in a box upstairs. Now, a lot of people try to put Jesus in a box, by the way. <laughs> He'll break out, I'm sure, if it's really him. Amen. But... Speaking of Jesus breaking out, it's getting close to him breaking out in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I think these are probably some of the most exciting days that history has ever known. I'm one of those radicals who firmly believes that Jesus Christ is going to come again, and I believe he's going to come again soon. So we're looking at this in study. We started with eight weeks of studying what, what, what the end times would be like in the realm of religion. And there's a lot of prophetic statements and scriptures. The whole book of Jude, most of uh, Peter's second letter is given over to the end time apostasy of all the, the things that will be going on in the religious world and even specifically within the, the church. The Apostle Paul said in the last days, doctrine of demons would come in. In other words, there'd be a lot of false doctrines. In fact, I, I don't know if you uh, caught it or not. I, I caught one of the newscasts that was talking about uh, the new churches that are opening up that are churches for atheists. That's kind of like having a pig stand for people who can't eat pork. I don't know. <laughs> you know I don't quite get the concept, but I certainly it does, again, reflect the day and age we're living in. They're, and they're mega churches. I mean, they're big churches that are being established. They're using the same marketing plans as the church is using in some of the mega churches. Uh, so that kind of points out some problems there. But they, are, they, they get together. They, they have some songs they sing. They sing some inspirational songs, I guess. Maybe you're the wind under my wings or something. I don't know. That's quite inspirational, I guess. And then they have a little devotional for about 15 minutes, you know, and then they take an offering. Oh. And, of course, I think the bottom line behind that whole atheistic church movement is probably the offering. Uh, <laughs> and also they say they're going to use those offerings for political influence in the days that we live in. But, again, this all points back to where we're at. I mean, who would ever thought, you know, we'd have churches for atheists, you know. It's just uh, it's, 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 it's a strange world which we now live in. Amen. But we've talked about a lot of these strange events as we've looked at the end times and what the world would be like, and certainly the world is a confusing place that we're living in. We've talked about how it affected the church and is affecting the church. And now, as we moved in starting last week, uh, last couple of weeks, we dealt with uh, the perilous condition of the times that we're living in uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Today, I want to move to a, kind of a different format of teaching and preaching on this as, we, as we're looking at the end times. Today, I want to talk to about three things. Specifically, I want to talk about... First, I'm going to give you seven quick reasons why I do believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ from a personal standpoint. The second thing I want to do is give you a quick overview. Just a, I want to show one slide that kind of gives an overview and walk you through it of uh, what you might call the prophetic calendar, the, 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 the order of events of the end times as we can piece it together from the New Testament and from the Old Testament. And then we'll look at, uh, just close with, I'll give you nine quick things on... Uh, why it's important that we as a people understand prophecy and if we truly are believers in Christ Jesus, why we need to get our head wrapped around what the Bible's teaching in regards to prophecy. I know you're thinking that's a lot of material, but it's not as much as you think, all right? So let's get started. You ready? Say amen. The sooner you listen, the sooner we'll start. You know, if you get slow, I slow down too. It doesn't help either of us. First of all, let's look at seven reasons why I believe that the Lord Jesus will come again. And more importantly, why I should have probably put on there why I believe Jesus will come again soon. Because I do believe he's coming again. The first of the seven starts like this. I believe because the Father, our holy God in heaven, has pledged that he would come 
and that he would do these things in the end times which he said he would do and clearly lays them out as, as having a descendant of, of, of David upon and, and Abraham upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. Those promises made to judge all things at the end of times. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, there's just a little segment of, of scripture. And it says, because he was prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. And it goes on to say in that passage, therefore being highly exalted, you know, at, at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out which, uh, uh, forth this which you both see in here. It was not David who ascended to heaven for himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. These are all prophetic scriptures from the book of Psalms that, and, and, and written for us again in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost when this message was preached that one day that God would fulfill his word about Jerusalem, about Israel, about his covenant with Israel and about the end days. And because God said it would happen and Jesus been raised up in the New Testament, we see as a witness to all these things, I certainly believe it. If that was the only passage from Psalms that talks about the end times and that God would one day set up a throne and establish it uh, by, by his resurrected son, Jesus, then we ought to be believing it. But of course, that's not the only place in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament that talks about the Lord's promise to, to be fulfilled in the end of times. So I believe because God the Father has pledged and promised it, I also believe it because God the Son has promised it. John 14, 3, there's that passage which is used a lot at funerals, but it's really a word of hope to, to all believers, living and dead, basically, where Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The Lord said he's going to work so in, in such a fashion that in the end times, in the last days, it'll be marked by his returning to come gather his people so that all of his saints will be with him. He's preparing a place. So you have a word from the Father, you have a word from the Son, but you also have a word from the Holy Spirit. He affirms it in the book of 1 Peter. And there's a lot of prophetic statements in 1 Peter, but listen to this one. As to this salvation, this this, this gathering together of God's people, this glorification in the end times. The prophets who prophesied of this grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking as to what person or time that the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. He was talking about these Old Testament prophecies that were led by the Holy Spirit, which is the, the Spirit of Christ, which is the Spirit of our God the Father, that the Holy Spirit in his ministry was testifying to what would happen in the end times. And even through Ezekiel, through Isaiah, through Daniel, through all these prophets who prophesied hundreds of years before Christ came, that the Holy Spirit moved upon them and affirmed it through the prophets that it would happen. We ought to believe it because God has said it and because his, his son has promised it and because the Holy Spirit affirms it in scripture. I always like when people come to me and say, you know, I have something on, um, from, from a good source. You like that one? That usually means that's best not to go any further and stop it right there. But when it comes to the second coming of Jesus Christ, I have it on a good, reliable source. In fact, not only a good reliable source, the best reliable source, and that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If throughout scriptures you see them attesting to the fact that in the end of time, Jesus Christ is going to come again, then you ought to mark it down, he's coming again. But we don't stop there. The fourth reason is not only have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit testified to it, the angels have foretold it. In Acts chapter 1, you see the Lord Jesus as he's ascending up into heaven with his disciples gathered around him. And as they're gazing intently into the sky while he was going from them, it says, Behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him and them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come just in the same way as you have watched him go. The way he departed is the way he's going to return. So now you have angels prophesying and telling us that Jesus Christ is going to come again. That's why I believe it. But there's also another reason, number five, because holy men of God, prophets of old, prophets of the Old Testament and New Testament, have by inspiration of the Holy Spirit declared it to be so. This is a great passage, you know, in, in 2 Peter when it says, you know, there's no prophecy that was ever made by act of human will. Now he's not talking about all these false prophets and Nostradamus and all that stuff, you know, Nostradamus and all his prophets. He's talking about biblical prophets, all right? 
He said, not one biblical prophet just kind of thought, hey, you know what, let, let, me, let, me, let me come up with a plan. How about we tell everybody that God has a son and he's going to come and he's going to die and he's going to be raised from the dead and then he's going to take the seat of the throne of David and he's going to come again in glory. No, every prophecy in scripture was not by some human mind, imagination, or fantasizing. It was directed and, and, and given by absolute word and inspiration from the Holy Spirit of God. So we have these men of God being moved by the Spirit of God to affirm these testimonies that God is going to send his son at the end of times Jesus Christ is going to come again. Number six, because the resurrection of Jesus also assures it. Acts 17, here's the word. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, capital M, Jesus Christ, all right? He's going to judge the world whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. He says that the resurrection is a witness to the fact that God is going to judge the world through Jesus Christ in the end times. For that to happen, there has to be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number seven, and there's probably 700 if you really want to go through the list. Because fulfilled prophecy guarantees it. You say, what do you mean? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Think about it just for a moment. Take away the New Testament. Let's just look at the Old Testament for a moment. Hundreds of prophecies... Books of the Bible in the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis on to the book of Malachi, are given prophetic verses and prophetic words and prophetic chapters given over to the declaration of the fact that God was going to send a Redeemer, a Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Lord. Over and over, this prophecy has been given to us. And what happened? Well, just as all prophecy does, shall and will come to pass, this pa these passages came to pass. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. The scripture said he would be. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. The scripture said he would be. Jesus Christ lived a spotless life like the scripture said he would. He was offered like a lamb as a sacrifice for our sins, like the Old Testament said he would be. He he came, he delivered, he spoke truth, he raised people from the dead, he healed people just as the scripture prophesied that he would. He was betrayed like the scripture said he would be. He was given over to the leaders as the scripture said he would be. He was rejected as the scripture said he would be. He was beaten as the scripture said he would be. He was whipped as the scripture said he would be. He was nailed to a cross, died on a tree as the scripture said he would be. He suffered in agony as the scripture said it would happen. All these things came to pass. He rose from the dead as the scripture said he would. Verse after verse the Old Testament is fulfilled. Looking at them as a whole of the Old Testament, perhaps from that platform of living in those times, you thought, looked at all this stuff about Jesus, this coming Messiah, and say, that's some random stuff. There's no way all that can be fulfilled in one person, but it was. And we would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That everything that was said about him did come to pass, just as much as everything that is still said of him is still going to come to pass. All those prophecies that came to pass are testimony and a guarantee to the fact that all those prophecies that yet to yet remain to be filled, will be filled, and will come to pass. Jesus is coming again. Mark it down. Get it set in your mind. We believe because the Bible preaches and teaches. We believe the Bible is the word of God and the Bible is true. Now, that's the seven reasons. Let me give you a, a quick overview. And we are going to be looking at some of these overview of these events in, in, in some detail in some situations, not so much in other situations, over the next several weeks as we get into the Word of God together. This is a chart we'll be showing a lot, all right? Uh, does, this one, does this one have a... This one doesn't have a laser. It's got one, but it doesn't work. Anyway, all right, go back to my, my chart. I'm sitting there pushing buttons and 
trying to find the laser button. If you look at this, you, it's kind of a general chart. talks about the Father's house at the top. The bottom line with the long air from past ages to future ages, we just call this time, all right? As far as men knows time, and it starts and ends as far as man knows time and space and goes into eternity. But we'll start right here with what happens. Hey, hey, don't get ahead of me. Go back, 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 back. Go back. Don't get, go, keep going back. Not that far back. Now, I'll take from here, all right? Thank you very much. Y'all give him a good hand of applause. <laughs> Don't do it again. No. <laughs> I wouldn't want to work back in that booth for anything in the world. How about you guys? <laughs> I served, I'd rather serve up here. Amen. But when you get into this, we see the incarnation, the resurrection of Jesus during this time that all those prophecies fulfilled. And then from there, we go to the, the next event during this church age in which we lived in, these thousand years that have passed since then, there, it's coming to a point where the next prophetic event will be the, the, the Lord coming down. Now, this is not the second coming. It's not the glorious appearing of Christ. It's that where he comes as a thief in the night to take away those who love him, all right? The rapture of the church. And we talk more about that in the following weeks and get a little more detail about that. But what, this is the next event. You've heard me use the illustration of a, of a music box before. If, if you know... You ever taken a music box apart? I, I loved when I, especially when I was a kid, take stuff apart. You know, just what, what makes it, I, I, you know, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. But just to take it apart and see what it, what it, how, what makes it works. I used to tell Cherish's dates. My daughter, when she had boys come over to the house to, to take her out, I'd, I'd, I'd let them know that I love to take things apart. So, <laughs> or I'd be cleaning my guns one or the other. But anyway, if you take a music box apart, you pull out that little cylinder, there's pegs all around that little cylinder, and it sets in there, and as you wind it up, the cylinder turns. And every little turn, the little peg comes around and strikes one of the music notes that are there. So the more that it turns, in other words, all that's gonna play on that music box is what has been predetermined by the person who put the pegs where they put the pegs to create the melody that they want to. Well, time is like that. God's got it all pegged out, all right? And as time turns, these events unfold as scripture, as the Bible and the prophets have told us that they would unfold. Everything that's taken place up to this point where we are right now, unfolded just as God said it would unfold, all right? Now, the next big note to be struck on this little cylinder, on this little God prophetic music box, is this event of the return of the Lord Jesus for the saints and for the church. All right, so that's the big event. You say, what's next on God? What has to happen before that has to take place? Nothing. Right. There's really nothing that we can see in scriptures that has to prophetically be, be fulfilled before that happens. Now that's, you know, that to me, that, that's exciting. So that means that at any moment, any time, there's this, there's, this, there's this expectation that we have that Jesus Christ could come back at any time to receive those who love him as their Lord and Savior for him. Now. What happens when the church goes? Well, we know it's going to be absolute chaos in the world, which I believe will probably be the big thing for kicking off the tribulation. But in heaven, this is what happens because on the earth there's going to be seven years of tribulation. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in heaven, what's going to happen up there? Well, there's several events that take place. One is the believer's judgment, which Paul refers to as the Bema Seat of Christ, where we as Christians are going to stand before the Lord and give an account for our life. Did we use the gifts that God had given us? Were we faithful to be the men or the women, the young people that God had called us to be? You know, were we faithful what God put in our hands? Were we good stewards of time and talents and treasures? Did we honor the Lord with our lives? That's going to be at the Bema seat where the Bible says we will be tried by fire. Then after that, Revelation 5 talks about a time, and I, I believe this is where it fits, of, uh, where there's a season of great praise and honoring and, and glory that takes place. The marriage of the Lamb is, is it, it, in this period of time. So what we're having is events in heaven, Meanwhile, back at the ranch, things are not going so well. Seven years of hell on earth, basically. A lot of people refer to it as the tribulation, the first three and a half years, the last three and a half years as the great tribulation. Well, just put it this way. If you're here for any of it, it's tribulation. It's miserable. It's hell on earth. Now, there's a lot of views about the rapture that we'll talk about in regard to this. Some people believe it's going to happen in the middle of rapture. Some people believe it's going to be two raptures. Some people believe it's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. So we'll talk about rapture views in a different message as we get on into our study together. But as you follow this during the tribulation, you see the four horsemen, the wrath of God's poured out upon the earth. You know, the Antichrist is manifest, a false church, the prophet, all those things. Seven years this goes on, the world is in absolute turmoil and chaos and crisis. Antichrist comes in the middle of this, promising peace. There is no peace. 
We'll talk about him in another message as well. But at the end of the seven years, there's this glorious, here's the second coming. Christ appears in glory. Revelation 19, Mark 13, Luke 21, Zechariah 14, Isaiah chapter 2, Matthew chapter 24. All these scriptures deal with this glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior. At the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon has taken place. All the armies of God. Jesus comes back with us, all right? And destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his glory. It just talks about and a two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth, which is the what? The word of God. And destroys Antichrist in that moment. You say, what word? Something like drop dead and it's over, all right? <laughs> He's done with, all right? False prophets done with, taken care of. Devil is, 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 is thrown in the pit for a season, all right? And then this begins, you have the battle of Armageddon, the false cry, the false prophet, the Antichrist, thrown in the lake of fire. Uh, then you come, Satan's bound for a thousand years during the millennial period. During this time, there's the judgment of nations, the judgment of, of Israel, all that takes place as we begin the millennial age. For a thousand years of absolute peace upon, upon, upon the planet. And we'll talk some about that. At the end, though, of the age, there's one more battle. Can you believe it? When Satan is loosed and is the last battle to be fulfilled on the planet. But at the end of that, the devil's cast into the, the, the pit of fire, you know, into the pit. And we go on in to the glorious ages. But as we do, the last event where all men are gathered together at the great white throne of judgment, where we see in Scripture talks about the separating of the, the sheep from the goats, where everybody who doesn't know Christ is going to see the true, just God. They're going to see the true and just opportunities that God gave them. They're going to discover they had no excuse to deny God. They had no excuse to resist God. They'd fabricated everything because they loved themselves when they wanted to love God. A new heaven and a new earth, and we're on into the future ages. Now, that's that's a lot to look at in just a moment there, but we're going to start taking that chart apart over the next few weeks and looking at it to see what the, the Lord has to say to us and how it relates to us as Christians. Because a lot of people don't understand that this is relevant. This is relevant. This is what the book's about. You know, this is, this is where, it, you know, where it starts, where it ends. All right, and where we go on for eternity. So I just want to close this message today to give you that overview and to give you nine very important points here of why we should study and why we need to understand the times that we live in. That we need to be people of wisdom. We don't need to be like the Pharisees whom Jesus rebuked when he said, you know, you guys can discern the skies and you know if it's going to rain tomorrow, but you don't know the times that you're living in. We don't want to be like that. We want to understand the times that we're living in. We talk in our church, we use a popular saying called, for such a time as this. We believe that God has raised up Believer's Fellowship to be right where we are in this generation and the day that we live in. We've been given a mandate. We've been given a, 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 a glorious responsibility to be the people you know, I, 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 for lack of better terms, we want to be a flagship church, amen, that says in the end of times, we're not going to bow down to popular culture. We're going to stand and we're going to worship God and we're going to preach the truth of the word of God and we're going to take people into a deeper walk with God. We want to see people go deeper. We don't want to see them live shallow lives. So we want to get in the word of God and to do that, we need to understand where we are in the process of all these end time events and what God has called us to. So why do we even study these things anyway? First of all, because we need to understand prophecy is probably one of the surest evident signs that the word of God is true. All these fulfilled passages about Jesus, for them to all accurately have come true, I mean the odds are millions to millions to one that all those events concerning what would, would happen in regard to a real man being born in fact, you know, if we can look at this later on, but you know, the Bible, Daniel even told us when Jesus would be born, what year he'd be born in. If you follow the prophecies of Daniel, it says after a certain amount of years, a certain amount of time, this is going to happen. And after that happens, this is going to take place. And when you see this, you know it's time. And then he goes on to say, that's, the, and this is the time when Messiah will be cut off. I mean, the, if anything, we study more of this, we start understanding what we say, wow, the word of God is true. You know, it's true. All these things that God said would take place, they are taking place. I mean, when you start looking at it, it's, it just proves the authority of scripture. But also we need to understand and study scripture because of the relevance and the prominence in the Bible that prophecy has. Do you realize 
Over and over the scriptures talk about the second coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. One verse out of every 25 in scriptures speak about the second coming. That's a lot of scripture and the scriptures given over to prophecy in the end times. There's not one single book in the Bible that doesn't refer to Christ coming again in some way or fashion. Is that not phenomenal? Not only that, the second coming actually receives more attention than any other doctrine in the Bible. It is the most discussed doctrine in scripture. That he is the king and he will reign over the kingdom. 17 Old Testament books and one New Testament book are given entirely over to prophecy. So we need to realize that if prophecy is so prominent in the scriptures, why do we need to wrap our head around it and get a grip on it on some level in our spiritual lives? Prophecy also is given to us to help reveal the power of God, the wisdom of God, the ability of God. And the more that you study the word of God, you know, you see as prophecies are fulfilled, more and more around you than you, you realize that only God has the ability, you know, to, to do that. Only God is, can sovereignly state something's going to happen and, and it happens. And you see the power of God. You see the sovereignty of God. But you also see when you study closely, you start seeing the wisdom of God and the great wisdom of God in, in preparing, you know, fallen man for, a, for an eternal relationship with himself. And in looking at that, I think it demonstrates, you know, if God possesses the ability to rule the world and to rule time like that, then certainly he possesses the ability to take care of you and to take care of me if we'll trust him. We can put our hands in. He's a reliable source to trust. So prophecy is important for us. The fourth reason I have here is that it reveals the purpose of God. It helps us to see that God does have an eternal plan and operation. And he has an eternal purpose is that all things are going according to schedule. Let me put it this way. All things are going according to his schedule. It's not always my schedule. You know, someone said to me today before the service started, one of the elders over there at the other camp says, you know, it sure would be a great day for Jesus to come. I said, you're just saying that because you're in church today. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm that way. I'm sorry. I told Kathy I'm working on it, but I'm going to get over it one day. But in reality, it's a good day for Jesus to come today. There's not really a whole lot stopping Jesus from coming today. All right. There's nothing else that has to be done scripturally, I, I believe, for Jesus not to come. I think we're pretty much at this point. That's what happens next. So it is a good day. It could be today. But we also see that, hey, it will happen when it happens, just like all the other prophecy in time happened when it should happen. It doesn't happen by happenstance. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens according to the will of a sovereign and holy God. It ought to excite us about God and about our relationship and it gives security in our life. Number five, it is a major key to understanding the word of God. You know, we talk about the importance of prayer and having a teachable spirit of understanding the word of God. But you need just to have, be praying over the word of God, studying the word of God, have a teachable spirit in the word of God. But there needs to be a recognition of uh, fundamental doctrines of scriptures, you know, and what this whole issue is all about. Where's all this leading to? What's all this bringing us to? It's bringing us to that place that prophetically says that one day when everything is done just the way God said it would be done and Jesus sets his Lord over all things that he said would happen and over all the nations and over all the time and over all the cosmos that he will turn in turn, turn around and submit that all to his heavenly father. This is where it's all going. This is where we're all headed to a great day of glorious living and glorious life. You know, sometimes people think about heaven like pie in the sky. Listen, it's far beyond pie in the sky. But I think that unless we understand a little bit of this, we have a, a mindset for prophecy on some level in our spiritual life, then we're not going to really get all of what the Bible's trying to lead us to and teach us about we need without, without knowing about the, the second coming of Christ. Number six, it is the hope of the church. We as a people of God, we look for this day. For Titus 2 talks about we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, he's talking about two events, not one event. He talks about the blessed hope and he talks about the glorious appearing. The blessed hope is that taking away the church before the tribulation. Amen. Uh, the glorious appearing is at the end of the tribulation to start the millennium. The glorious appearing of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But that, that encourages us. 
and especially in the day and age that we're living in. These are strange times, all right? We talked about the last two Sundays. Difficult days will come. Perilous times will come. You, you turn on the news, the world's gone nuts. I mean, for a lack of, you know, deeper terminology, we go nuts. People, you know, they shoot their mother, they turn around and kill their wife, they shoot their kids, you know, they, you know, they shoot up schools and theaters and blow up things and, you know, I mean, just weird things go on every day. I, I, and, and, and people look, stand back and say, I just don't know how people can do that. Perilous times shall come. It's the day in which we live in. But we're not discouraged if it gets worse, we're still not going to be discouraged. We're going to be encouraged because the Bible said it would be worse before it gets better. It's going to be bad before it gets great. And men are going to come to the place where they're, where they're either so depressed and so defeated, and as Matthew said, their hearts failing them for fear, or they're going to be encouraged by the, knowing how close they are to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number seven, it also motivates us to serve the Lord. If indeed we are looking for the blessed hope, how can you be anticipating that? And how can you be excited about that and not serve the Lord? How can you be say, saying, you know, I really believe Jesus is coming again, but I'm, I'm not doing anything about it. My life's not right. I don't care to get my life right. I'm going to continue to live the way I want to live, do what I want to do. I'm not going to be discipled. I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to receive the word of God. I'm just, you know, I'll go to church, but man, that's it. See, you, you don't have an anticipation there's not, a, there's not a, a looking for that blessed hope. Because if you really are focused on that, what happens? Well, it's with anything in your life. The more focused you are upon it, that's what you become most excited about. Now, we do that in a lot of general senses in our life. You know, we get focused on, on, on all kinds of things. If you're a sportsman, you, you get focused on a fishing trip. You're getting ready for it. You're getting excited about it. If, you, and if you're going to go hunting, you get focused on that. If you're going to go shopping, you know, that may be your deal. And, you know, if to you, that is a sport, you know. <laughs> You get pumped up, you get excited about it, you know, you, you got your, your gear on, you're ready to go. So, it, it, the, the, but the bigger picture, outside of little excitements and things like that, that we, we get in, involved in with hobbies and interests in life, let's talk about the big picture of our life. Jesus is coming. That ought to drive us and motivate us and stimulate I've been given gifts for this. I've been given his Holy Spirit for this. I've been given his word for this. I need to start moving forward. I need to start serving God with more enthusiasm because, listen, I, wanna, I want to... I want to be right with him when he does show up. If we're looking for his soon return, we're certainly going to be found serving him when he does return, if we genuinely are. That's the seventh. The eighth thing is this. Prophecy is a source of comfort and stability in the hours of crisis. Just as I said, as things get worse and worse, not only we can be encouraged on one level, it also can be a source of comfort for us because... You know, as we sit out and, and we talk about the difficult days that we live in, and we, we, we sometimes just wag our heads and doubt and unbelief of what's happening. Can, that, can it get any worse? The Bible says when Paul wrote the Thessalonians, he, he wrote him in that letter. He says, you know, these things are going to happen. And he talked about all that, that many of the end times events in that first letter. He said, but hey, comfort one another with these words that Jesus is coming. When difficulty comes, comfort. When loss comes, we have a comfort. We have a hope. If I lose a loved one who loves Jesus... It's comforting me that I, I'm going to see him again. I'm, I, it's not lost to me. I'm comforted by that. It, it encourages me. It's, it's not like a person who, who has no hope and no faith. You know, they have nothing to look for. They, they have, there's, it's just despair. I don't want to live that way. Now, and I'm not, by putting my faith and my confidence in Jesus, it's not some pipe dream. I'm putting my faith in something that's proven and solid and real. He did do what he said and came the first time. Thus he will do what he said and come the second time. So I can comfort you and you can comfort me in difficult times. I, because why? God's a big God. If he said he would, he will. That settles it, all right? If he said he would, he will. Ephesians talks about you know, the sovereignty of God when it says, you know, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. So if he said this is going to happen, then to me, that, that's encouraging and that's comforting as well. But the ninth reason, and again, we could probably go on for days listing reasons, you know, of why we should study prophecy. But I figure we'd do nine and get to studying prophecy after that. Amen. A true study of prophecy, I believe, according to the Bible, is going to produce a different you. You won't be dead and dull and stuck in a rut when you start really getting serious about Jesus is coming again. 1 John 3, 3, we're told, and everyone who has this hope, and the hope it's talking about is Jesus coming in, in the context. 
who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, the idea here is who is pure? Jesus is pure, right? And if I want to be like him when he appears and I want to be in love with him when he appears, and if I want to be, if I want to be walking with him, appears, hey, you know what's going to happen? The more I look to him, the more it's going to promote an attitude to be like him. It produces a different kind of living. You know, have you ever been caught where you were just ashamed? Yeah. Some of you have been children, have been caught. You know, some of you have been adults, you've been caught. You know, dealt with the guy this week, you've been caught. He's filled with shame and tears and sorrow. We, we get caught. Listen, there's one place I don't want to be caught out of the will of God. It's when Jesus shows up. In fact, the Bible says when he appears, there will be many who will be ashamed. I don't want to be in that group. You know, I don't want to be in that group that's not serving Christ. I don't want to be in that group that's not talking about Jesus. I don't want to be in that group that's not interested in the word of God. I don't want to be in that group that's not, you know, committed to living a, a, a life for Jesus Christ. I, he's coming, and it could be any moment. I don't want to be, Jesus gave parables about that, didn't he? He said there was a guy who managed a vineyard and, you know, while his master was away, he didn't do anything. He was lazy. He was slothful. He didn't take care of things. He beat the servants and, you know, just ramrod things he wanted to do. And he kept, you know, his idea and his mindset was, hey, when I know the master's coming, then I'll get it all together. But then the master showed up and he wasn't ready for him to show up. I don't want to be that guy. Do you want to be that guy? I don't think you do. When that moment of glory comes, I can't just even imagine for a moment the rapture of the church. Now, that word's not in Scripture if you're looking for it, all right? But the, the, the theology and the doctrine's there. It just uses different terminology, the blessed hope, things like that. And we'll talk about that. But in that moment, we could be here, we could be in bed, we could be, we could be at work, we could be on the freeway, you know, it, wherever it is, wherever that moment comes, it... I don't want to be filled with sorrow. I don't want to look at Jesus. Now, the Bible says we're going to be glorified in an instant. But that doesn't mean we're not going to be cognizant. Because we're going to go stand at the Bema seat it talked about, right? We're going to be made aware. It's not like, you know, oh, the rapture's here, and just everything that's in the past in the past, so big deal. I have to give an account. I can just live my life, oh, well, I'm under the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason you're not going to hell. But I want you to know when that fire falls at the Bema seat, you may think you're in hell for a moment. <laughs> it's not going to be a happy moment if we're not right with God, if we haven't spent our lives in, in commitment to Christ. Get right with God. That's the, that's the heartbeat of the prophetic study, is that as a church we're right with God. As people we're right with God. As Christians we're right with God. We're right with each other. We're excited about Christ. Read you a passage from 2 Peter. I think it kind of looks a little fuzzy when I put it up on the overhead. Starts in verse 8 there when he says this. Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as you would count slowness, as some would. But God is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away, or the roar of the elements will be destroyed, intense heat, the earth and its works are going to all be burned up. He's kind of giving a general overview. All these things are going to be destroyed in this way. If that's true, what kind of person, what sort of person ought you to be in holy conduct, in godliness? We should be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning. The elements are going to melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He says, listen, if anything ought to promote right living, right hearts, it ought to be a thorough understanding that Jesus could come at any moment. Any minute. Are we ready? I guess you want to see, if you, if, if, the prophet Amos, he kind of wrapped it up pretty simple. And he said, hey, prepare to meet your God. Now, why would he say such a thing? Because we're not prepared. Most churches aren't prepared. Most people aren't prepared. Most pastors aren't prepared. Prepare to meet your God. Get your house in order. Get your life together. Get excited about Christ. Fall in love with Jesus, fresh and anew. Have revival in your heart. Get excited about the things of God. Get excited about what God's put in your life to be, to be a steward over your life. Get excited about doing what God's called you to do. Now, I'm not a big fan of the contemporary version, but I'm going to read you this same passage. It says, Dear friends, don't forget that for the Lord, one day is the same as a thousand years, and a thousand years is the same as a day. 
The Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises. Some people think he is. In fact, God is patient, but he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. For the day of the Lord's return will surprise us like a thief and the heavens will disappear with a loud noise and the heat will melt the whole universe. Then the earth and everything on it will be seen, be seen for what they are. Everything will be destroyed. So you should serve and honor God by the way you live. You should look forward to the day when God judges everyone and you should try to make it to try to make it to come soon. On the day the heavens will be destroyed by fire, everything else will melt with heat. But God has promised us a new day, a new heaven, a new earth where justice will rule and we are looking forward to that. We ought to be excited about Jesus coming. It ought to drive us in our, throughout our days. When we feel like giving up, it ought to be that impetus. It ought to be that thing that presses us forward. When we feel like folding up our tent and say, I just can't do this anymore. But Jesus is coming. Put my tent back up. When it ought to be say, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't really have a lot to live for. I've gotten the place in my life. You know, you know it's like one of my evangelists and all my friends are dead. <laughs> There's no time for stopping. Jesus has come right now. You're going to feel awful foolish if you folded up your tent and he hadn't called you yet. You know? It, it, it. You, you go when God says we go, at his time, in his place. We keep moving forward because any moment, any time, any second, he could appear. He's coming. I believe it. I hope you believe it. But if we truly believe it, then let's do what God's called us to do. Would you stand this morning? And I would say to you today...